Well, hello. Good evening. Um, thanks for coming out for our uh, Bible study tonight. I like that lamp, Sue. Oh, my gosh. What's going on there? No, it's okay. What? Can I ask you? What's what's the uh, did, what, what's the story behind this? I don't think it'd be too distracting if you want to just keep it on during the whole study. It'd be okay with me. Add a little, add a little ambiance to our discussion. Um, but we will go ahead and, and get started. Thanks for being here tonight. Um, looking forward to our discussion. Hope it's a, a blessing to you. Let's start off with a word of prayer, and we'll sing a little bit. Um, so bow with me. Father God, thank you for uh, your, your blessings, your love for us, your goodness. Please bless this hour uh, as we sing and as we read and hopefully get to discuss from your word. We pray that we're built up and blessed by, by this time. Uh, Father, we think of those on our prayer list, uh, those we mentioned in Bible class this morning. Uh, others, you know them all by name and what they need. Uh, we think of uh, the party that was for Debbie this afternoon, and we're thankful for her, uh, thankful for the way that she contributes to this church family, and uh, we're grateful uh, for them. And Lord, we want to pray that you bless us as we move into this week. Uh, give us peace and strength to do your will at all times and trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Uh, I'll warn you, this has happened before where I'm singing and all of a sudden my voice just dies and my, my throat is very dry right now and I'm trying to supplement that, but if it, if it falters during the singing, you'll know why. We were coming from 1 John chapter 4. This morning, in easily the most well-known passage in the book, and one of the most well-known passages in the Bible about how God is love, we love because he first loved us, and so that's behind our songs for tonight. Our first song, uh-oh, hang on. Ah, I don't have the projector on, I'm sorry. Can't really do much without the projector on, so give me just a moment to turn that on. Our first song, I'll go ahead and say, is How Deep the Father's Love. That was a very beautiful song, one that we haven't sung here in a while, um, <clears throat> but uh, very fitting in light of what John says about how God is love, and we see his love in God sending his son uh, to atone for our sins. So I thought we'd start with this song as soon as the projector comes on. <clears throat> How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon a cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice 
place, call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know. have paid my ransom, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Next song will be, Oh How I Love Jesus. <clears throat> and get a drink of water. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh. How I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love, who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. How I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. Last song will be Nearer, Still Nearer. Um, <clears throat> First John 4 talks about abiding in God, and this one certainly seems to, to relate to that same idea. <clears throat> Nearer, still nearer, close to thy heart. Draw me, my Savior, so precious thou art. Fold me, O oh, fold me, close to Shelter me safe in that haven of rest. Shelter me safe in that haven of rest. Nearer still, nearer, nothing I bring. 
not as an offering to Jesus my King, only my sinful, now contrite heart, grant me the cleansing thy blood doth impart, grant me thy cleansing, thy blood doth impart, nearer, still nearer, Lord, to be thine, sin with its fire. I gladly resign all of its pleasures, pomp and its pride. Give me by Jesus, my Lord, crucified. Give me by Jesus, my Lord, crucified. Nearer, still nearer, while life shall last, till safe in glory my cast through endless ages ever to be nearer my Savior still nearer to thee nearer my Savior still nearer to thee. All right. Well, I'd encourage you uh, to go ahead and open up your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4 if you've got them. Uh, I think it will help to um, have this passage. Uh, actually, I forgot. I've also went ahead and put the, the, the text on the screen again for tonight, so you can also see it there. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to, again, just read the passage before getting into any discussion. I think it will be helpful to have uh, the whole thing in our minds, whole thing fresh in our minds. So I'm going to read this again, uh, and then we'll talk some, and, and I, I hope um, it's a blessing to you. Feel free to make any comments or questions you'd like along the way. Uh, this starts in verse 7 and goes through to the end of the chapter. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Okay. 
So a couple things I wanted to throw out for us to, to think about tonight for discussion. I want to go back to um, the, the main statement that really anchors this whole passage, um, that God is love. Uh, and so we get the first reference here in verse 8. It says it again in verse 16. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. It's very significant, and this is uh, actually something I remember being pointed out to me when I was only a sophomore in college, and we were actually uh, first learning Greek, and we were translating 1 John, because 1 John is one of the easiest in terms of grammar parts of the New Testament, so a lot of people will begin with 1 John. And the professor made this point that I've always remembered, and then I, I've come across it since then in, in like commentaries and things. He says it's, it, they, they made this point that I think is, is true. It's very significant that John says God is love. He does not say love is God. He says God is love. does not say love is God. Think with me about those two statements. God is love. Love is God. What is the difference? Do, do you see a difference between those two statements? And if so... What do you think that difference is? Daniel, can I get the microphone to you? When I hear what you just said and I think about it, um, love can easily become an idol. Mm. And, you know, as kids, we have this idea of love that it's a butterflies in your stomach kind of thing on a, for a crush, you know, at school. Um, but as you grow up and you grow into a, a relationship with a spouse or with a brother, you realize that love is so much deeper than just a butterfly feeling or a, a nervousness or something like that. And, you know, I, I think a lot of people in, in the worldly culture make love to be an idol and, you know, they're searching for it and they're always, they've always got to be loved and they've always got to go searching for it. And it can easily be something that uh, becomes just something that you chase for the rest of your life. Yeah. Whereas love is of God. Yeah. And so if you seek God, you find that love that people may be seeking in all kinds of other places. Yeah. Uh, Luann. <clears throat> Dovetail to what he said, it puts... Love is God puts love as our ruler, as our, as the one we worship, as the thing we worship, mm -hmm. kind of that good feeling. That's what a lot of people may, you know, if they don't have the butterfly feelings, that's kind of what they're seeking. But God is the being. Yeah. And God is full of love. It's, yes. that's how they're equivalent words. Mm. God and love are equivalent, whereas yeah. love is like is God, is what we worship. Does, yeah. does it kind of kind of in that somebody else may have. Yeah, I think what you're saying, and you can pass it to Daisy. But I think what you're saying is, if we said love is God, then we would be worshiping something very impersonal, right? It's not God is a a, a person we can relate to, but love is something more abstract. Maybe that's at least part of it. Uh, Daisy? To get love, you have to go through God. It's not the other way around. You can't get to God through, like, what am I trying to say? You can't get to God the opposite way. You have mm. to go through him first. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> it makes sense in my head now. Yeah. I know how to articulate. Well, if, if we do say that love comes from God, John says that, um, then... You can't, um, you can't genuinely find it somewhere else, right? It ultimately comes from him. Yeah. Uh, Bob and I saw Chris as well. Yes, I can relate to that, Daisy, because I look at love being the source, or the core of why you love it. You have to have a great fundamentals or great uh, foundation to have love. And getting it back to the concern is God is love, but I'd like to ask Leah a question this morning. He said, God, 
John said God is not loving, but God is love, right? Yeah, John doesn't say right. God is loving. He right. says God is love. Right, John doesn't yeah. say God is loving. John yeah. says God is love, right? Yeah. Well, now let's talk about that, Lee. Um, when we said God, John says God is not loving. That, that put a different mindset in my mind. God is not loving. Well, it's not that, it's not that God is not loving. He, he is, but John, that's not what John says here. Right. Uh, he does not say God is loving. He says God is love. It, it is true that God is loving, okay. but, but it's only true because he is love. Right. Um, I got you. I got yeah. you. Does that make that sense? That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So I certainly am not advocating for an unloving God. Uh, <laughs> so, so I'm sorry if that was... That's okay, that's but, fine. Yeah. That's fine, thanks. Um, Chris, you had your hand up first. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. And then, Sue, I know you also I'll had your hand quick. up. I was just thinking, what if we said sun is light and light is sun? Yeah. What's the difference between those two terms? That's how I would say that would be like God is love, love is God. Sun is light. That's true, but would you say the light is sun? Yeah, because it's not like all light <laughs> necessarily comes from but, the sun. But, I'm, but who, who gets it next? Yeah. Okay. When I, we look at the world, God created this world, what all he has done for us that says God is love. No one has seen God, but we see all the results mm -hmm. of his love for us. That's why we can say God is love. Yep, yep, so true. Um, Chris? God is love in every aspect. When he gives us tough love, he gives us true love. His justice is love in every aspect. Thing they may so, again, if, if, we, if we got words backwards, love is God. First of all, sorry, I'm making this out like this. First of all, that would make God very impersonal. But also, um, if we said love is God, then that would make whatever appears to us to be love to be the right thing. And in that, if, if that's the way we're going to operate, okay, if love is God, then whatever is love is right. Well, who gets to determine what, what love is? It, from that frame of mind, we get to determine it. So when we say love is God, we're really saying we're God. <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're just following our own inclinations. But when we say God is love, then we recognize, okay, love comes from someone higher than us. Um, love comes to someone we have to submit to. Um, even when we don't totally understand, even when it's not easy, even when it's against our natural, natural inclinations. Um,
And so the world gets these two statements switched very easily. Um, they easily take God as love and make it love as God, which allows us to really be our own God. Uh, but Christ calls us uh, to not make that swap, to remember God is the one we worship and love comes from him. And so we see what love is when we see him. All right, well, uh, something else I wanted us to mention. Again, this is a, an extremely uh, powerful, well-known passage because of this declaration that God is love. This is actually one of three statements that John makes in his writings where he says, God is something. Uh, this is one of three. So we've got two here in, uh, let me go forward a little bit, two here in 1 John uh, chapter 4. Twice we read that God is love. I've got the other two just references on the screen. Uh, if you got your Bible, turn with me to 1 John chapter 1. This is one that we actually already read because we've been going through 1 John uh, for the past couple of months. This is the second God is statement. This is the message we have heard from him, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So before we read God is love, we read God is light. All right, now go with me to First John, or not First John, to the Gospel of John, to uh, John's big book, Gospel of John, chapter 4, and verse 24. This is uh, as Jesus is talking with the woman uh, at the well, and he says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So we have these three declarations about God from John's writings. Um, God is love, God is light, and God is spirit. Think with me about these three statements. What does each one of them tell us? That each one of these, I think, if we, if we think about them for a bit, they tell us, of course, something about God. God is. But that statement has an implication. It means something for our lives. It means something for how we understand God, which in turn means something for how we understand ourselves, how we live. Uh, so let's think about these three. Uh, We've already talked about God as love, of course, quite a bit today. Let's start with God as spirit. What do you think is the significance to saying God is spirit? Think, yeah, Bob. Go ahead. That's okay. That's okay. If it comes back to you, just you can raise your hand. Yeah, if you can pass it back to Luann. Yeah, thank you. It's he's not tangible in the sense of physical touching. It's not worshiping in spirit and truth is not tangible in in the same way that it was for people in the Old Testament, where they had sacrifices, they mm. could see it. Our worship is more <sighs> the gathering of minds and hearts and souls. Mm -hmm. you, we all have spirits, but we can't see them. We know it, it exists within us. Yeah. But I think you know your spirit exists more as you get older. <laughs> Because your body, you're, there's a separation between the two. I mean, you think you can do one thing. You think you're young, but your body says, uh, -uh that's <laughs> your physical. But, you know, if you think of a spiritual life being eternal, that's how I think of spirit. Mm. And that's how if we're made in God's image and he breathes his spirit in us, we have a part of him that lives in us. I don't know if I answered yeah. a question. Or, but. Well, no, I mean, you're saying great things. And, and going back to Genesis, right, God breathes the breath of life into Adam. Um, so certainly just by having a spirit that is, that's connects us to God in a way that nothing else in creation quite connects to him, right? Right. And, you know, you, there's, it's like you're thinking of a different dimension, you know, that's, 
has nothing to do with this physical world, but a world that we can't see. Yeah. And we probably won't see until we die. Yeah. I mean, whether good or bad, it's until our spirit leaves its temple, its capsule, we don't know what that world looks like. Yeah. Or how it feels. Yeah, I think you're hitting on something really important. And I, I want to say, oh, go ahead. Do you, do you have any more? No, no other than if you're people that get into paranormal. And stuff, yeah. I yeah. mean, that's kind of what they're looking for. Yes. Is that spirit and how they measure it, whether it's, a, I, I watch some of that stuff, but electro, you know, magnetic stuff. And, you know, yeah. they feel changes. We don't know what God is like and what he's made up of. Yeah. But that hunger for something invisible they are seeking something that we as followers of christ um have, have really already found but they are seeking for that right? right and if you think about jesus rising to heaven well they saw him go up but where did he disappear into yeah i mean was it did he allow them to see him for so long and then disappeared into another dimension that we can't see that we're, you know, if God is all around us, yeah. there has to be another world around us of yeah. some kind. We just don't understand it. Yes. <laughs> yes, I think you're hitting on something extremely important. Uh, Bob, I saw your hand. Pass the microphone to Bob real quick. No, it's okay. It doesn't have to be real quick. Uh, Lou ain't reminded me what I was going to say because we all worship in spirit, and I think that's a higher power. Most people in general uh, worship in a higher power. Uh, but the scripture goes on to say in truth, but most people are not worship. Well, I, I, sh I shouldn't say most. There are a lot of people that doesn't worship in truth, but we all worship in spirit. Uh, most spiritual-minded people worship a higher power. Mm -hmm. and that's what I was going to say a few, few minutes ago because uh, John says that we must worship him in spirit and in truth. But the bottom line is uh, we do worship him and we, we worship in a higher power. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you two are, are getting at something that I was hoping would come out while we were talking. You guys, are, you guys have kind of already said it. When we say God is spirit, Scripture is saying something that, that actually people 2,000 years ago took for granted that we don't anymore as a, as a culture. I'm not saying we here, but that is that there is more to life than what you can see with your eyes. Uh, go ahead, Daisy. I may be totally off by this, but when I see the three points, I think of the Trinity. So mm. God is love. That's God. God is the light. I think of Jesus yeah. spreading the light and then the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in us, telling us the truth yeah. and guiding us through his word. Yeah. That, I don't think that's, that's uh, off base at all because uh, Jesus calls himself the light of the world. Uh, and yes, God has, uh, in, in the mystery of the Trinity, there's the Holy Spirit and we read about the love of God the Father. So, yeah, the, the Trinity is very much at work in the things that we're talking about. Um, but, yeah, something that our culture no longer takes for granted is this idea that there's more to life than what you can see with your eyes. We live in a very secular um, world. We live in a world where uh, there can be almost kind of a default atheism among many people. I'm not saying everyone by any means, but the basic idea that what really matters is what's physical. What really matters is your flesh and blood, is the stuff you can see and interact with. Um, and, you know, uh, before you were born, um, you know, you, you weren't part of this world that matters so much. And when you die, well, that's kind of all there is. And that's the way so many people in this world operate. Uh, just by saying God is spirit, uh, scripture is making the assertion there is so much more than what you can just see and interact with and feel with your senses. Uh, there is more out there. And that is such a word of good news because as we live in this material world, we see how unfulfilling it is to think that this is all there is. Uh, with the pain and brokenness and hurt and, and sorrow and tragedy uh, and the sense that we're not gonna be here forever, all of this stuff makes what is physical uh, unfulfilling. And so by saying God is spirit, scripture is calling us to more than that. 
Uh, I saw your hand start to go up, Nathaniel. Um, well, I have so many thoughts on this, but uh, I'll limit it to this one, is that, um, you know, there's a lot of people out there that would say you're foolish to believe in something you can't see. And um, I was going down a rabbit hole of near-death experiences pretty recently. And mm. anyone who's been, you know, pronounced clinically dead and then was revived, uh, there's a lot of stories out there. And they all have a very common, you know, one thing in common. And that is that there is something beyond this. It's not just lights out. And as I was talking to a coworker who was not a Christian, his belief is that, you know, it's, it's just game over. And upon mm. your last breath, that's just it. And that just, there seems to be something that's just foolish about that. Like, to think that this is it. Yeah. Like, why else would you be here? Like, it, if you don't believe in God, you really have no reason to have any morals. Yeah. You know, why would you need to be a good person if there's nothing beyond death? There's there's yeah. just no reason. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that is a little uh, what's the word I'm looking for short-sighted or, yeah you know, uh, yeah absolutely which is why the the idea that all there is is this life that we can see is such a an empty unfulfilling one and many many people find themselves running up against that and living very very you know living lives with a great sense of hopelessness because of that and scripture offers us so much more so how about the second statement? God is light. Oh, go ahead, Mary. <laughs> well, when you think about light, you know, God is light, you think about God is good, he's mm -hmm. holy, and he's true. Yeah. Because when you start thinking about darkness, you think about what is false. Yeah. And what's the, the devil, in other words, what's evil. Yeah, yeah. Light is powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Daisy, were you going to? Oh, okay. Okay. It was on its way back. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was listening to Charlie Kirk yesterday, and he made a point. He said, uh, he said we are to be salt and light. The one thing that uh, salt and light both have in common is that they change the atmospheres around them. Mm. And I've never really thought about it like that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and so you guys are hitting on it already. Uh, when we say God is light, then by implication, where he's not, there's darkness, right? Um, and as, when we put that statement, God is light, in the context of the whole mean, message of Scripture, well, when we are separated from God, we're in darkness, right? Um, so we're in darkness, and we need his light. So we've got, there's more to this world than just the physical, and we're in darkness and need his light. And then we come to the one we talked about today, God is love. Uh, and so the, the light and the more that's out there than just the physical world is his love for us. That, that's, the that's the basic message of the gospel. If you think about, as we've read through the book of Acts, we've had so many sermons. Uh, on, if you've been there on Sunday morning, so many sermons. Um, and the basic message is there's good news. Um, there's a God. He overcame death. Your sins can be forgiven. And so he's not using the language of, God is love, God is light, God is spirit. But underneath all that is, are, are these truths. Um, there's more that's out there. You are in darkness. Come to learn the more. Come to know the love of God and you'll be enlightened, right? Uh, there's, that is all underneath the surface of all the sermons and acts is basically these three statements. Uh, Sue. Well, this is just a little playing on words. God is light as in weight. He's light. Oh, He's yeah. not heavy, burdensome. You know, he lifts the burdens up yeah. and makes it light. So that's another use of the word light. And Jesus does say, you know, come to me, you are weary and heavy laden, mm -hmm. pressed down. And he says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. I'm gentle and lowly in heart. So that's, that's not one that, that John says, but it is something that is true. Right, yeah. Bob? Uh, let's talk about God is light again, if you don't mind. As we look at light, God is light. He is our light. It's so wonderful to be able to see. Because if you can't see, you can be walking in darkness, and that's going to be dreadful, devastating, because yeah. God is not, God is not um, uh, a person that wants us to live in darkness. 
sin, and I consider that sin is darkness yeah. because it's going to be devastating. It's going to be frustrating. You can't survive in darkness. That's right. Can you imagine walking through your house, not having a light on? You're yeah. going to hurt yourself. Yeah. So God doesn't want us to be in darkness. He Absolutely. wants to have the light. And when we think of someone caught up in that sense of hopelessness, thinking this life is all there is, right? And it's the life that they can see with their physical eyes. But if we think about the inverse of, of these statements, uh, someone who thinks that this life is all there is, is someone who's walking around in darkness. And they feel it, they know it, because life is probably quite miserable when they're thinking about those things. Um, but God wants to turn the light on and show them that there's much more out there, and what they'll ultimately find is his love. Right. That's right. We, God can shine his light through us. That's what he wants to do. Well, um, <clears throat> we've got a few minutes left. I want to pose one more question, and it comes from verses 17 through 19. Uh, one statement really in these three verses, but I want to read all three to set the context. So I'm going to read these verses again. Um, By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. It's really verse 18 I want us to focus on, but again, we read the whole thing for a little bit of context. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Um, in light of that statement, I want us to compare this with another passage, this time coming from the Old Testament. Uh, if you have your Bible, turn to Proverbs. Turn to Proverbs chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 7. Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. All right, so the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And then one more, Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10. It's basically a restatement of what we just read in Proverbs 1. Not exactly, but it gets to the same idea. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So we have these two very different statements about fear. Um, 1 John makes what is clearly a negative statement about fear. There, there is no fear in love. If you have fear, you haven't been made perfect in love. And we're, we clearly are supposed to be made perfect in love. So this idea of like we, perfect love casts out fear. There's, so fear is this negative thing here that we want to move beyond, right? Uh, we want God's perfect love to, as it grows in us, we want this fear to be cast out. But then we turn to Proverbs, and we have such a positive statement about fear. The fear of the Lord is where it all begins. The fear of the Lord is where wisdom comes from. Uh, if we, and, and throughout the rest of the book of Proverbs, it's clear. It, it's not just where it begins. We're supposed to live our lives with this kind of fear of the Lord. If we walk away from that, we walk away from wisdom. We walk away from what's good and true. We, we abandon uh, the life that God calls us to have. So... Two very different statements about fear. How do these statements go together? Do they go together? Can they? What, what do you think this could be all about? How can we read fear of the Lord is this wonderful thing, it's where wisdom comes from and all these things, and then on the other hand, perfect love is supposed to cast fear out. How do you, how do you guys think these two statements might be able to go together? Daisy. Um, and I think we've studied it before um, in Proverbs, but I think of it more as a fear of disappointment, like you don't want to disappoint God. Um, mm -hmm. And so when I think of the fear and love, there is no fear in love. We, we don't have to hang on to that disappointment because we have been cleansed by uh, Jesus' blood. Um, but at the same time, it's still good to hold on to the proverb of, wanting to do what God wants us to do and not totally just soak in that blood of Jesus us because we still want to do what God wants us to do. 
yeah. um, and not take it for granted. Yeah, okay. Uh, Nathaniel? I don't want to discount the rest of Proverbs, but you know, I do want to keep in mind that this was Old Testament. It was pre-Jesus. It was it was at the same, you know, during the same time periods as, you know, where God got angry with humanity and caused a flood, wiped out humanity. He, you know, struck down people who touched the who was it, Uzziah, <clears throat> who touched the Ark of the Covenant. You know, God in the Old Testament, God was a God of punishment, you know, and so I, there's a very healthy respect to fear the Lord in, in the Old Testament, and it's only through Jesus that we have the ability to not fear punishment. Mm. So, um, I don't, what do you think about that? Do you, you think I'm onto something, or am I off base? Well, I think you're touching on something that many people have thought about. Uh, God in the Old Testament versus the New for a long time. Uh, it's easy to read many passages in the Old Testament and say, wow, God is very vengeful, wrathful. You don't want to mess up in his presence. And then you come to the New Testament and it seems like, wow, God is very gracious and merciful and gentle. And so some folks see uh, almost like two different kinds of gods at work, and they much prefer the New Testament God, right? Not surprisingly. Um, when we really look closely at all of Scripture, I do think that that is a, a false dichotomy a, a, where you've got to choose between the God of the Old Testament or the God of the New. Um, scripture is very clear about God's unchanging nature, about how he had a plan in Christ before the world even began. Before the Old Testament even began, he already had plans for Jesus to come. And we have some tremendous examples of his mercy and faithfulness and kindness filling the pages of the Old Testament as well as the New. And also in the New Testament, we have some statements about wrath and, and judgment. Um, we have in the book of Acts, um, I'm going to blank on his name, Herod. <laughs> we talked about another Herod this morning. But uh, there's one of the Herods is struck dead in an instant because he refused to give glory to God. Uh, we have Ananias and Sapphira struck dead because they lied to the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, of course, we have the, the promise that Jesus will return one day. And when Paul talks about that in 2 Thessalonians, of course, we as Christians look forward to that with great hope and anticipation. But he's very clear those who um, have rejected uh, the, uh, the message of the gospel, he talks about Jesus coming in flaming fire, taking vengeance. You know, uh, So these are really... Uh, realities about God that, that pervade both Old and New Testament. Um, and so I, I would want us to be cautious. Actually, I would really want us to resist seeing God as one way in the Old and another way in the New. Um, he is one God throughout. And something that Scripture does show us a lot in the New Testament, including in our passage for this morning, when we look at all of God's actions, as Christians, we're meant to look at them kind of through the lens of the cross. If you could almost picture yourself wearing cross-shaped glasses, that's the prism for seeing God. So here, um, uh, let's see. In this, the love of God was made manifest. And John could have talked about anything in the Bible, but he specifically talks about God sent his son into the world, right? That's where love reaches its pinnacle expression. So uh, I'm sorry if I'm rambling a lot here, uh, but I, I do believe we're, we're looking at one God with one nature throughout. And while sometimes his actions are confusing, sometimes his actions we don't understand, while sometimes his actions might seem to us rather harsh or unloving, um, it is always coming from a, the same God who gave himself up on the cross. It's always coming from the God who is love. Um, I'm sorry, does, is that, how much sense am I making yeah, right now? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're on it, but I, I, I did just want to make sure that I pointed out that it is only through Jesus that we don't have to fear. Like, mm. I, I want to make sure that I'm not just throwing that out there. But, um, yeah, it, it is only through Jesus that we have the ability to not fear. So that's, that's why I said, you know, Old Testament was before, before they had the opportunity to not fear. Okay, and, I and see. so you know now, post Jesus, we have the ability to, to to not fear punishment. Yeah, 
I do believe that in Christ we have the supreme reason on this side of eternity to not fear. Christ is the fullest, I mean, it's the fullest revelation of God we have until Jesus returns. Um, but in the Old Testament as well, uh, we see like David's great confidence as he pours out his soul to God and, and things. So I don't think God wanted his people ever to, to walk around paralyzed by fear uh, in Old or New Testament. Um, and yet we have these two statements. Fear is a positive thing in Proverbs. Fear is this negative thing in First John. Uh, I saw Jason, Jason's hand go up. Yeah, I, you know, obviously, I think both of these things are true, right? What's being said in Proverbs and what's being said in First John. I think, to me, Proverbs, like I focus on uh, the fear uh, being the beginning of something. So that may be that fear of torment, you know, uh, e eternal damnation, right? Could could. You know, that's what may kickstart you to, to look to God, yeah. to turn to God. So that's, that's a healthy fear. You should fear that. And because you fear that, you should, you should turn to God. That's the beginning of you, your wisdom. That's the beginning of you starting to understand your p place here. But then what John is talking about is if you, if you to me, like if you obey the God, you're a Christian, and you're still afraid, then you you might not you might you might not be as close to God as you think, right? You should, you know, once you once you are with God, God abide in, God abides in you and you in Him, and you don't have to be afraid, right? And so that's you know the the fear is the beginning of that knowledge, but this this again it just I think it speaks to the this you know, the love being perfected in us, right? There's this completeness, this kind of, it, it's a different situation, you know, when you, when you, when you fear the, the beginning of that knowledge being fear and then to the point you are here where it's, it's, you have this now relationship with God and so you don't, you don't have to fear. Yeah. You're perfect. Yeah, and, and we do see that play out in life um, with children. You know, they, it would be wonderful if they just love their parents so much that, oh, yes, of course we'll do what you say, but we all know that's not the way it works. You know, Yes, they might love you, but you also have to have some discipline. There might be a timeout. There might be a spanking. There might be a loss of a privilege, right? There's this um, aspect of, there's this reality that parents can do something that you don't want to have happen to you if you don't obey them, right? So there's this fear here, but then as we grow, right, we can we can live less and less from that concern for fear, where even if, you know, if, if, if things are really going well uh, in terms of parents raising their kids, which I hope I learn about that as, as time goes on, but if things are really going well, let's say the child is in a situation where they could do something wrong and they know their parents would never know, right? There's not going to be a punishment. They still do the right thing, right? Because they're not operating just out of fear, right? They also are operating out of love. Uh, and over time, that becomes the motivation. And there's really not the fear, fear thing is not really a problem anymore. So that certainly does happen in life. Uh, and, and I do think that is what John is getting at in 1 John. Um, the only thing that, that I think might make me think there could still be more going on is Proverbs doesn't just speak of fear. I mean, in the passages we read, it talks about it's the beginning of wisdom. But it, it is something that is meant to be a lifelong thing. Uh, we're can always meant to have the kind of fear of the Lord described here. So it seems like there might still be more going on. Um, Chris, I saw your hand up. Your hand up.
Yeah. Um, we think about why Adam feared after that sin. Um, I think we can relate to his fear because God had told them, you know, if you eat of this fruit, like, you know, you will die. So they, they know that, and so that would cause them to fear. But, but it seems the mistake was that fear motivated them to try to hide from God. Uh, and, and really, when we think about the Christian life, I think we see this really captured in the parable of the prodigal son and other places. Even when we sin, God wants us to then come to him, not hide from him. Uh, because even if it's a little painful to come to him in the long run, this is where, this is where real healing, forgiveness, all these things are going to be found. Um, yeah. Daisy? Um, I was just trying to think about like what, who he was writing to when he was writ, wrote this letter. And I was looking back at my, the notes in my Bible and about how some of the people that were in this congregation might have been kicked out of other congregations for something they've done and they've repented mm -hmm. of it. And so this fear might be something that's lingering over like you guys are saying that, that is an unhealthy fear and not a healthy fear of God. Um, yeah. And so they're, he's trying to correct them on what is healthy and what's not healthy. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mary? I was just thinking, if you are genuine about it, you know, if you're really truthful about your love, then you have no fear because you know that love is going to take you to God and that love is going to have salvation. If it's this false stuff, when you go around pretending you are something that you're not, you, you love it. Like I might say, I love Daisy. Knowing all the time I hate her. I mean, that, that won't get me into heaven. So we have to be really truthful about what we're doing. And this love that we're showing, we have to be truthful about it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. They didn't come in the flesh. Yeah. yeah. Christ, um, n but they're both the same because the word it said it begin it existed before the world began, mm -hmm. so it was from the beginning. They're both the same. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, and not to get us too off topic here, but that that concern with the whole message of the book even comes up in our passage. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. God abides in him and he in God. And here's maybe part of why this is so important. Not just because that's what happened, although that, that's reason enough to we need to believe that that's what happened and not something else. But uh, Jesus coming in the flesh as the son of God, that's, that's a major part of how we've come to know and believe the love God has for us. It's, we see it because Jesus came in the flesh. Uh, and when we sacrifice that belief and say, well, he didn't really come in the flesh, then it's like, well, did we really see love incarnate in, in and Jesus Christ? And that's Christ? what the entirety of the, the letter is yeah. uh, because it's uh, that uh, agape, that sacrificial love, that's an action. That's, you can speak, you can say words a lot, but yeah. there is action. God's action was his son, yeah. you know, and that showed humanity yeah. uh, what the truth was. Yeah, and this is uh, also going on here where, let's see. Um, there it is. No one has ever seen God, right? But we have seen his actions, right? We've seen exactly. God send his son into it's, the it's, world. It, it, uh, that, and I, I always think of uh, this God is love. That's a verb to me. Like, that yeah. it's, it's something you express. It's something you show. Yeah. Because you can, you know, just like you, people have like, their Facebook lives, and then they have their life. Yeah. And yeah. so when, uh, if you want that sacrificial love, yeah. then you have got to, it's an action that you have towards your other, bro your brothers and sisters. Yeah. Yeah. It's Which, not just saying it, it's doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's exactly what God has done. Yeah. Um, the Bible is not 66 books of God philosophizing about love. It's 66 books of God acting yes. to save humanity. Yeah. 
Um, well, I want to go back to our original question about the fear and, and what Proverbs says is, is what's said here. Um, I think we've had a lot of good things to say. Um, I'll just weigh in on how I think this kind of conundrum is to be solved. And it's very much in line with what Chris was saying earlier. And this does go back to something we emphasize a lot here, reading passages in context. And when we read fear of the Lord in the context of Proverbs, and fear is this negative thing in 1 John, uh, I think it, it seems pretty clear as we're reading both of these statements within the broader context of the whole Bible, really. We're talking about two different things with the same word. Uh, we're talking about two different kinds of fear. And one is healthy and one is unhealthy. And a way that sometimes people put this to, to help us just grasp it quickly is there's a difference between the fear of the Lord and the terror of the Lord. Um, fear really does have more than one meaning in Scripture. Uh, fear can mean te you're terrified, or you're overwhelmed with, with fright, um, or it could mean more like uh, you reverence someone. You have a deep abiding respect and reverence for them, and that is fear. Uh, that's a very healthy, mature, sober kind of fear. The unhealthy kind is the terror that just paralyzes, right, that grips us, that makes us just think about self-preservation and things like that. Um, and so it makes sense that the, terror, the, the terrorizing, paralyzing one is what, as we come to be made perfect in love, this gets cast out, right? This is overcome. But also, as we are made perfect in love, the healthy kind of sober reverence for God actually deepens. Uh, in a sense, you actually have more fear as you love because you have a deeper reverence while you also live in less terror of God. Uh, and so that, I think, is, is what is going on here. But it's difficult, and so I'm, I wanted us to take some time to talk through it. Um, does anyone else have any, anything else along these lines they may like to, to share with us? Okay, <clears throat> well, uh, thank you all for a great discussion tonight. I uh, hope this was a blessing to you. hope this passage is a blessing to you. It's just such an incredible declaration of who God is and by implication how we relate to him and how we are supposed to live. And so um, I encourage you maybe to meditate on it some more and maybe read it before you go to bed tonight or something like that because uh, it's, it's incredibly powerful. If there's nothing else, uh, let's close with prayer. Uh, I'd like to ask if... Uh, Jason, would you mind being willing to dismiss us in that prayer? Thank you.